Well, I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk. I am so excited to be joined again by Bill Fathers. Bill is the chairman and CEO of CoLogix. So, Bill, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you again. David, thanks for having me back again. You bet. And and for those of you that might not know Bill, I wanted to uh, just give a brief background on him. Uh, he has been in the communications infrastructure space now for uh, a long time. He has, um, you know, a number of high level positions. He was an executive vice president of cloud services with VMware. Uh, he was president with Savvis, uh, and he serves on the operating board with Stone Peak Infrastructure Partners as well. So uh, he has a rich pedigree in this space, and that's why it's so fun to get to hear um, your perspective. So, Bill, it was about we were talking uh, before we got on. It was about a year ago. Uh, that we started, uh, that we spoke about CoLogix and where your company was focused. Um, a lot has transpired since then. Um, you know, CoLogix has, is in the hyperscale market now. And that was one of the things I really wanted to focus on this uh, conversation with is, is just how and why uh, CoLogix jumped into the hyperscale market. For the first seven or eight years, the company really focused on building a network of carrier neutral facilities in Canada and in some secondary markets in the United States. And that, as you know, that takes time and effort to build up <clears throat> 70, 80, then 400, and now 650 discrete carriers, all built into meet me rooms and carrier neutral facilities across now 10 markets across the US and Canada. About three years ago, uh, a company called Amazon Web Services came to us and said, listen, we would like to be able to connect to our clients as cost effectively as possible. Uh, we want zero latency if we can get it, and we want to save you know, on wide area network costs. So they deployed their customer edge nodes throughout our footprint in eight of our 10 markets. Mm. Um, and we thought, hang on, this is new. So th at that time, carriers were our biggest client base. Um, we obviously were facilitating a lot of network peering. We were attracting internet exchanges, CDN platforms, but a very network-centric business. Over the last three years, we've singularly focused on uh, that cloud ecosystem around the public cloud players. Other, other ecosystems have grown up on the platform, financial services, um, which is mainly around conventional credit card transactions, digital content processing. One of the movie studios in Vancouver uses to get to Southern California and other places. Um, and artificial intelligence, you know, is also a, a nascent uh, ecosystem. But the public cloud from Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Alibaba, Oracle, IBM, SoftLayer, the, the, the size and the scale of their deployments dwarfs everything else. And mm -hmm. it has become the singular focus of the company is to now grow that ecosystem across all of our markets um, by becoming increasingly integral to the public cloud players infrastructure. Uh, we, can, we can talk about how that has unfolded. We now have 29, we're about to announce our 30th public cloud on-ramp, which compared to our private peers puts us well ahead. But that has acted, they've acted as magnets. Uh, and a lot sure. of people say, I'm, I'm using the jargon on-ramp, but I know sure. your, your audience will know. They get oh, it, you bet. They know what I mean. And these things act as magnets. And obviously what we've done is we've tailored the go-to-market of the company. We've tailored the product of the company. Because as you know, the small network deployments grew, that then started to attract clients who wanted to put bigger footprints closer to the, the cloud edge, closer to the customer base. So we started uh, broadening our portfolio into what we call hyperscale edge facilities, which allow us to offer you know, not just the conventional space you'd see in a carrier hotel or an annex. We now have one to 50 megawatt deployment options in uh, in four of our markets where we've built very large wholesale facilities, but they're obviously very tightly tethered. So tonight, if I look forward to today, the hyperscale segment uh, and um, the, the sort of the businesses that follow them into market probably represent 65% of our bookings and carriers represent, you know, 25% and the other ecosystems make up the balance. So that's how things have shifted over the past three years. Yeah, it's impressive. When you think about 
um, those bigger users that you mentioned and the needs that they have, how have you seen those change over the last three years? And, and obviously, you know, you all have been working with those companies for a long time. It's been, you know, over the last four or five that you've been working with them in this larger capacity. But what's that, what changes have you seen in the way they've approached the market? The, the main shift has been a, a rapid deployment of their compute and storage resources hmm. as close as possible to the to the customers um, to help differentiate them in things like you know database technologies and artificial intelligence type services, which are the sort of value added services the public cloud players differentiate themselves by. You know they spotted that there's a sub segment of the market for whom latency and or cost is an issue, so you know they're therefore trying to co-locate. Uh, mm -hmm. as much of, you know, big chunks of their compute and storage resource out of their core, you know, middle of Nebraska type data centers into uh, as close to the edge as they can get it. Mm -hmm. But obviously they're, they're cost conscious. So, you know, getting in a carrier hotel, that's a little expensive, but getting in a facility that's specially built for them, you know, is interesting. You've seen the, obviously the Equinix X scale uh, projects uh, and joint venture you know, and that's exactly what, what, what we're doing. We, we are doing with a joint venture. We're doing it with our own balance sheet. Um, but, you know, that's what we're seeing is that, that trend of um, all three of the majors, I'd say, the public cloud players are doing it at various different speeds. Um, candidly, it feels like Azure is slightly fastest at the moment. They're deploying mm -hmm. a lot of, they've got three or four different kinds of edge nodes, as they call them. And they're being rolled out quite publicly in you know dozens of markets in North America. We, we have a number of them. Um, and then but obviously AWS has its own strategy, which they're very public about. Uh, and, and Google is doing it as, as well. So that but that's huge. I mean, none of us thought it was going to happen that quickly, that they would mm -hmm. thought they'd have on-ramps in carrier hotels, they'd have their big compute storage resources in their own vast and ever-growing campuses. But I didn't see them bringing that much resource uh, uh, to close as well. Obviously. Um, they're rounding out their portfolios in terms of how many on-ramps. So it feels like Azure uh, has caught up with AWS pretty much or overtaken them to some extent. Google is now nearly there as well in North America in terms of the number of on-ramps. They've got Oracle, IBM seem more cautious uh, in terms of that, and they're probably less latency sensitive in terms of where the apps are. Um, and and the, I guess the other trend is they're just growing, the public cloud players are growing like crazy. I don't think, mm -hmm. I mean, these are, these are vast businesses that grow at 40%. It's it's just incredible. You're 32 billion of revenue and you're growing at Yeah, 40%. sure, yeah. It's, so there's, there's a general sense of, you know, extraordinary momentum. Uh, and a lot of the professionals who work in the big cloud players spend every day trying to, you know, procure intelligently as they can, um, but just keep up with the demand. And it always feels like demand from them is just slightly greater than they ever anticipate, mm -hmm. which, is, which is, you know, if you're on the supply side of that, you know, sure. it's... It, it's great, but obviously it means you've got to keep up with demand and you've got to, you know, you've got to be able to be flexible enough to keep up as things change on the fly. How you, you mentioned some of those, um, you know, the second maybe group of cloud service providers that, that certainly are growing. They might not be growing at the rates of some of those larger companies, but what do you see from that sector? Maybe what do you think will be coming in the next few years with, you know, some of those other companies that certainly have footprints that, um, are serving global customers and, you know, will grow most likely exponentially in the future. What do you think of those companies? Yeah, you're exactly right. That, that, is, that feels like 2021, 2022, we're beginning to see those come to market with quite big, uh, quite big RFPs for, for lots of capacity as they, as they roll out their footprint. It feels like a number of them were quite comfortable with only having six or seven global data centers. And that was sort of working for them in the, you know, if you're a very, very large enterprise software company, there's not a huge amount of latency sensitivity there. Mm -hmm. And so you could service North America from Silicon Valley, Dallas, and Ashburn, maybe mm -hmm. that works, or Chicago, one of those. And that works really. And, you know, your worst case latency is 70 milliseconds or something. And that's fine. If it's somebody, if it's a billing agent checking an order form, that's probably, you yeah, know, this ain't Roblox. You know, it's not like it's real time gaming. It's, you know, it's accounting. Sure. Sorry, folks. I'm sure accounting is just as impressive and, yeah, uh, and important, of course. And important, of course. Uh, but, but so that worked. But yeah. then I think things got a bit bigger scale and they started, oh, okay, well, there's a, because they got bigger scale, I think they then started thinking, well, hang on. 
uh, there's some tax breaks here. So we should probably go to states where we should be rather than just being like the obvious California, Texas, North Virginia. Why don't we go to these places where there are um, tax breaks? Latest thing, which is great to see, is about sort of environmental considerations. So well, shouldn't we be in Montreal? Because Montreal is 99% renewable energy. It really is. And um, certainly as, as we see those big software companies come to uh, come to Canada, which there's a certain size they get to, and they say, yes, we're going to enter the Canadian market. Um, we see on that front, there's a sort of rule of thumb has emerged. If you're going to cover cap Canada, you put 60% in Montreal and you put 40% in Toronto. Mm. Um, obviously, Toronto is a much bigger market. So you, you'd think sensibly you'd put 80% or you could maybe even get away with servicing everything from Toronto, but it's far less environmentally friendly power. So you go to Montreal as big as you can and you put something in Toronto. So... I agree. I think they're all up and comers. They're all starting to buy big footprint. We see them entering the Canadian market um, and they are starting to balance factors other than just performance. They're thinking about tax breaks, environmental uh, considerations and other as well. Most of the demand that we have seen from certainly a large cloud perspective traditionally has like been from companies headquartered in the U.S. and like pushing out towards other markets. How do you feel like the, or maybe help us understand maybe international markets or international users coming into the U.S.? Or you mentioned Canada as well. I think that's a really interesting study too. Do you feel like that demand is equal to 2020? Do you feel like it's it's different today than it was a year ago? How are you seeing that? Canada, I'll just dwell on Canada. Canada's 60% of our business, and uh, we're very lucky to have a very strong position in that market. Uh, Canada is in, uh, it's got a very specific and deliberate project at the moment to make itself left, less dependent upon the United States digital infrastructure. Today, mm -hmm. if you want to get traffic from Montreal to Vancouver, it goes through America. So incredibly, mm -hmm. there's very little east-west traffic, east-west east -west bandwidth and capacity ever built in, in Canada. It always came into the United mm -hmm. States. Sure. Um, so this notion of digital sovereignty, as they call it, of being able to help Canada regain its independence has manifested itself in quite a few different ways. Uh, one of them is we're seeing uh, a lot of um, new submarine cables uh, mm -hmm. that are launched now that land natively in Canada on the East Coast and natively in Canada on the mm -hmm. West Coast. You'll see an announcement from us. We recently acquired a new facility in Vancouver that will become the de facto submarine cable landing station for, for the West Coast of Canada. But it's all driven by the government saying, Let's reduce our dependency uh, on, on other folk as well. Um, so we're seeing, you know, um, that that's a fairly major factor in terms of, uh, uh, of, of, of driving, you know, potential demand uh, for that particular market, if, if that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. And then talk about maybe some of the, the U.S. markets that Cologix has chosen to focus on at that hyperscale level. Why why do those markets make sense for the company? For the company as well, the other markets, yeah. yeah. So your, your thing was about inbound international demand. I was yeah. saying Canada's getting itself more sovereign. The other thing they're doing is sponsoring and they're sort of encouraging a lot of international carriers. So mm -hmm. we've done more business inbound with international carriers in 21 than we did the previous three years. So uh, Scandinavian, European, Asian carriers are, are popping Canada like crazy um, and bringing obviously often the international traffic in and out. But they're also competing. A lot of those international players are also competing in the sort of national peering market as well, up against the sort of Kojiko, uh, competitors to people like Kojiko uh, as, as well, uh, or Cogent rather. So, um, so, that, so, yeah, we're seeing big growth from international carriers into actually Australian, Singaporean, Korean, Japanese, uh, Scandinavian carriers coming into the Canadian market. And, and in the United States, frankly, a, a very big Chinese owned uh, social media platform that all of our children spend all of their life on. I mean, they're buying cola like a drunken sailor. I mean, they're, they're with, so, <laughs> and very bandwidth intensive. Um, and, you know, the, the, the very bandwidth intensive. Yes, we're like other providers. We're being yeah. on. And, and that, I mean, that is unbelievable growth. I mean, that that's. Yep they're going to be a third of the colo market. I mean, a third of the sure. colo market in North sure. America in 2021. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, I know. that's a lot. It's that's a lot. lot. That's a yeah. lot. Um, so that that's a, a good, uh, but in general, I think yeah, obviously there's only really the sort of Chinese owned social media platforms that seem to have that scale. 
that yep. then come into the North American market at, at any great size. Think of any other European players that we see coming in, a handful, yep. but not, nothing of that scale. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So more broadly, so um, as we've become so focused on public cloud, uh, our initial markets in the United States, uh, Columbus, Minneapolis, uh, Jacksonville, New Jersey, Dallas, Columbus, as you as you probably know, has become a hotbed now of high absolutely, school. yeah, yeah. Uh, so with Facebook, Amazon, and Google, we've owned the Carrier Hotel facility. We built our first hyperscale edge facility. We went crazy. We built thirty two megawatts in Columbus. Mm. Banks looked crazy. at us and said, "What? I mean, exactly. What's that all about?" Yeah, you know, we'll come back in seven years when you filled it. We filled it in eighteen months, and we sold mm. thirty two megawatts. We sold twelve megawatts into it in the last quarter of last year alone. And we're now triggering a build of our fourth and our fifth uh, data centers in the Columbus market. So re- really pleased that obviously it's pure luck that we, we chose a market seven years ago that happens to have become, you know, Iberscale Center. Uh, Minneapolis, it just, just it's just geographically a phenomenal place, east, west, north, south. So it's just very network savvy, uh, some cloud, some streaming of content, uh, but that's a good, strong market. The point, though, was as we found that more and more of our customer base and our traffic is really cloud oriented, we we didn't have a presence in Silicon Valley and in Ashburn, which, of course, are the two biggest cloud traffic gateways in the world. Uh, Our model has always been to avoid, you know, competing head on with the other public REITs in the carrier hotel world. But we had such demand from our install base to say, you've got to have something, you know, in these markets. So we were able to acquire a, a, a business in Silicon Valley, uh, an existing data center that was already host to one of the big public uh, uh, software companies uh, that has an on-ramp and also already had 27 uh, carriers in it. It had the bones of being a good carrier hotel. So we acquired that uh, not while, about four or five months ago. Um, it's an existing 20 megawatt facility with a 10 megawatt expansion uh, in the same piece of land. Uh, and we, we acquired it four or five months ago, uh, and we're, we're just now triggering an expansion of 10 megawatts uh, to, to expand uh, and build adjacent to the current facility in Silicon Valley. So that's Silicon Valley, Ashburn, you know, the last thing the world needs is another provider in Ashburn, right? It's like, <laughs> congratulations, you know, you're a supplier 25 into the market. However... Um, you know, when, when you're hosting governments, major, you know, corporations, the sure. big scalers, they say, listen, what have you got in Ashburn? Yeah, you, you got to be there. Yeah, you've got to be there. That, yeah. That's it. You've got to be yeah. there. Um, so we acquired the best piece of land to be there. It's, it's, it's the piece of land immediately adjacent to Equinix's uh, DC2 facility. Oh, yeah. uh, and we took the plunge uh, at the end of last year. You know, things are going well across the business. We, we literally doubled the size of the company last year. That, that's, mm. that's how profound the impact has been on uh, on us in terms of the, the impact of the surge of traffic. So we, we've gone for it, we broke ground, and we just we just got pad ready as at this month. So we've got a, uh, a, a, a 72 megawatt uh, site, that, yeah. which, which we, if you'd asked us two years ago, you know, we couldn't have afforded the, the nameplate for a 72 <laughs> megawatt sure. facility. Sure. And now, here we are uh, well, building, building that. That's exciting. I, I, you know, it's interesting to watch the company transform over the last several years. Um, you know, with that transformation takes a lot of capital. It's one of the things our industry has seen a lot more of in the last, you know, 24 months has been more capital coming into the space. What dynamics uh, does that additional capital change from your perspective? I mean, you're, you sit at the tip of the spear for CoLogix, um, but how does having available capital help as well as you know, if there's too much capital, what what issue does that create? Yeah, the simple. I think the best side of the equation. The let's do the easy one first. So the debt markets have gotten really, really attractive. So mm-hmm. there's there's now the market is we've all matured enough as a business, uh, and and a number of us are now making a profit. That you're seeing some of the privately held companies do some really creative, you know, and I don't want to start giving too much credit to the competition, but there's been some really creative debt structuring done so that some of the companies are now 10 times levered, but are getting, um, you know, interest rates of 1.72%. That's game changing. As Mm. there's three or four of them have done it. um, And that, that is really disruptive because if you look at the debt profile now of these private companies where they're able to borrow 10 times their EBITDA Mm -hmm. and they're only paying interest rates of 1.7, that's better than digital realty. So you're Mm -hmm. going, oh, hang on. Uh, So it's much 
Yeah, it's so suddenly people look at pr- pr- publicly held companies like QTS and say, hang on, uh, you guys are only four times levered and you're paying 3.75 on your coupon. So the finance geniuses say, listen, all we need to do is buy that company. And sorry, I'm, I'm perhaps taking some of the steam out of the genius that is private equity, but it's, <laughs> I mean, it's basically, so I can buy this publicly held company, I can double its debt and I can reduce its interest rate by half. I've doubled the value of the company. So, you know, that's the, that sort of financial engineering. It's like a nuclear weapon, this, this, this latest round of, you know, the, this way to basically uh, securitize your assets uh, and apply debt against them in a cleverer way. Basically, it's going to really change, you know, so if people can take debt at 2.2%, then mm-hmm. equity is slightly less attractive. I mean, you, okay, what well, if I can get debt for that lower price and I can get that much debt, then it might be, you know, so they, there might be less uh, opportunity for, for equity. There's still a place for equity, but there's going to be less opportunity for it. Um, and I would say on the equity side, it's the same old. You've got, you know, lots of new entrants blundering into the market who, you know, will ask a question, you know, what's a data center? And you say, okay, well, you know, <laughs> Dr. David, he'll, he'll start you out with a, you know, not all data centers are the same, you know, um, so you start with at one end of the spectrum, a lot of new money that sure. is just getting started. And at the far end, you've got these extremely experienced now, you know, sovereign wealth funds, private equity firms who are on their fifth or sixth. You know, people like Macquarie, you know, mm-hmm. they've done s- several investments, you know, EQT, um, obviously Digital Colony, Stone Peak, you know, it do- does lots of investments. We're very experienced. Uh, so they tend to get very fussy and say, well, you know, the investment data set, the profile we're looking for is exposure to hyperscale, interconnection or strong differentiation, or some other barrier to entry that gets everyone comfortable that, you know, if you grow your customer base so that the hyperscalers are your biggest client, you know, you just look at the sheer scale of those customers and think, well, what's going to happen at renewal? Aren't you just going to get, anyway? so um, to quite a lot of focus, sophisticated at one end and a lot of less sophisticated that require a lot of education at the other end, I'd say is, is kind of where we are. Yeah, that's a great, Great point. It's one of the, your your comment around the the debt and the debt being so cheap and attractive. It's one of the really interesting things I think that has made this market so competitive at the private and the public level. You know, and I think a lot of people looking into our space have a hard time understanding how it's it's become that way. And and a lot of it too is you have a lot of I think senior leaders at companies that have left some of these publicly traded REITs and are now you know, uh, have retooled and restructured and have a company and they're out there doing the work. So uh, it's been really interesting to watch. That's a good, that's a very good, there's a lot of that, isn't there? There's lots of ex-public company senior leaders who are now running these privately held uh, development companies that are that are pursuing riches around the world. Yeah. Yeah. Very, and very competitive. Yeah. So w- when we left our, our last talk and I wanted to kind of end with this, you know, uh, we talked about the future of the industry and you talked about just the digital infrastructure, that this was the the era of digital infrastructure and the data center. So that was a year ago. Obviously, we, I think we have lived in that that industry and we are watching a, a transformation take place. But kind of give me an update on kind of what you think about that today. And do, do you feel the same? Do you feel like that has maybe uh, gone faster than you thought? Like, where do you stand with with kind of that thought as it relates to the future of of this space? I'd stick to it. I'd say perhaps I'd underestimated the surge <laughs> of investment that would happen in digital infrastructure um, for sure. Um, and I'd just probably add two two things to it for, for a year in. I, so I'd have under, I'd underestimated it. There was more investment coming than I'd even thought. Uh, secondly, the speed of the global rollout has has taken a lot of people by surprise. Asia has overtaken North America in the space of six months. So that just mm. happened very, very quickly. The net, the net new investment in infrastructure for, for, for both North and South Asia has now far outstripped it. Um, Europe is now obviously characterized by a lack of supply and, mm. a, and a lot of demand. So you're seeing huge premiums being paid for uh, companies in Europe, who was on the supply side in the European market. And Latin America um, is just suddenly taking off. Uh, mm. So we, we at Stone Peak just announced the acquisition of uh, a, a, a fiber and data center business in Latin America, which, which we're carving out of Lumen. Uh, and that market has just started to hit something of an inflection point. So there's become a bit more of a, you know, it, this is a global thing now. Asia's leading 
uh, North America second with Europe and, and then Latin America. Uh, last thing I'd say is, you know, the, the Biden, certainly in North, North America, the infrastructure bill is, is the good news is that digital infrastructure is going to be a bit less of an outlier because that seems to be the only mm. thing anyone's investing in. Hopefully, you know, we're going to see you know, broader investment in infrastructure, roads, water, electricity supply mm-hmm. uh, start to catch up, uh, you know, less less on the sort of fossil fuel uh, stuff. But hopefully, you know, water, road, uh, power grids are going to see some increased investment over the next few years as well. It doesn't make, sort of, it doesn't make me feel great that digital infrastructure is the only thing getting invested in, but sure. other things will catch up as well. Oh, and I would, yeah, I would also say, you know, um, we, we just published our first ESG roadmap, um, mm. you know, and took real stock of saying, okay, where, where are we? We're at 48% renewable energy consumed right now. What's the limit of where we can push this? Um, I'd say we now have investment partners who not only are looking for the sort of uh, just just tell us what you're doing uh, to make sure that you've at least got this on your radar. They're now being very more pointed and saying, well, actually, we'd like you to see you to get you to you to get here in terms mm-hmm. of increasing your percentage of electricity consumed that's renewable uh, in terms of making mm-hmm. yourself more efficient and reducing your general impact, both in terms of carbon footprint and natural resources. So that that's turned. So both debt and equity investors are now luckily driving us to which is great to be even more environmental friendly than we were before well bill thank you so much this is so great the insights that you provided uh like i would say if you're watching this and you want to know where the industry is headed i mean bill has laid out a great roadmap for where people are focused uh and where the growth will continue to uh to take place so bill thank you look forward to doing this again and uh we'll see we'll see you soon great thanks so much david speak to you soon you bet